consumer price inflation. And uh, if you can't see it in the back, you can also come to the front or it doesn't matter. I'll be talking about all of it. Or you raise your hand and say, hey, this is not clear. Right? So here you see consumer price inflation. The different colors are different countries. It's also slightly different measures for the following reason. In the euro area, blue is HICP, the so-called harmonized index on consumer prices, because that's what the European Central Bank is looking at in its strategy. Uh, the most recent data point in October, 10.7%. In Germany, 11.6%. In Germany, actually, you have to go back long ways to get double-digit inflation. In Germany, you know, by the way, um, I had 73 was the starting point of the German uh, Anglo-German Foundation. 73 was also the year when we had the Yom Kippur War, a war, you know, attack uh, by by Egypt and Syria on and other Arab countries on Israel, and then at the same time, um, an oil embargo on the U.S. and and European uh, allies of Israel, and then we had inflation rising as quickly as now, although from a higher level. Uh, so in that period, in the in the 70s, uh, Germany was actually among the G7, the only one which avoided double-digit inflation. So now we have double-digit inflation. But the hope is, of course, that it will be much uh, uh, less long-lasting and hopefully uh, disappears very quickly. Here you see also uh, the U.S. for comparison. It happened earlier in the U.S. Uh, there are two different measures dashed the CPI. Is that somewhat comparable? The personal consumption expenditure is the measure the Fed looks at. That's really from the national accounts. So you have the substitution that people substitute away from expensive good, as a, from expensive coffee to cheaper coffee or from you know uh, things like that. Well, you, I cannot say to, I mean in East Germany they used to produce their own coffee, but you know we we haven't quite resorted to that. <laughs> I don't know, from other, from, uh, but anyway, so there is a substitution effect. That's why you can see the PCE actually rises less, but still um, that has risen a lot. And uh, light blue is the CPI in the UK. Right? So this has been an extremely fast rise in inflation. Um, I mentioned it. And also, by the way, in, in the Euro area, we've talked a lot about this is driven by energy. This is driven by energy. This is driven, they repeat it all the time, right? But even without energy, um, prices, 7% inflation. So uh, this has really broadened. And also, if you listen to Christine Lagarde, she's now talking more about broadening inflation. You see that also here now. So, so we're ahead of you, and maybe because it's the most recent data point. But so Europe, the Euro area is moving ahead, certainly ahead of the US, where you can see that the CPI has been moderating somewhat on very high level. Uh, in core inflation, we're still catching up. So this is basically both excluding energy and food. Food has also been rising very quickly, right? So you see that has been going up to 6%, over 6% in the US, UK here in the middle, but also close to 6%, the Euro area here closer to uh, 5%. The variation is big. Uh, France here, this is from last month, France with 6.2%. The French are very proud of that. They've also been basically fixing uh, gas, natural gas prices for households. They've been fixing electricity prices. So great uh, inflation measured in consumer prices doesn't rise as much, but who foots the bill? Of course, in this case, the government has to pay the difference. Right? They also have more nuclear power. So maybe they have more local production of, of energy uh, than we have, but still um, it looks uh, better in terms of inflation, but it's very costly on the other side. Uh, you have here the Baltics uh, with 25% uh, inflation. I mean, if you imagine 20, that's a quarter of your purchasing power gone. So, uh, I mean, that those are really major. I can't believe that some people say, oh, a little bit of inflation is good. Well, a little bit, yeah, if it's 2%, but <laughs> if within a year it goes to 25%, a lot is lost for any consumer, particularly, particularly those uh, who primarily uh, consume out of their current income. There are three stages of inflation. Uh, first, in 2020, in the coronavirus crisis recession, everywhere we had a very steep drop in production. Right? So we'll see that in a moment, but very steep drop in production. And uh, normally you'd say, well, then in any recession, inflation comes down a lot right? because companies cannot raise prices anymore. Maybe they have to lower prices, but at least they don't raise them. So inflation should be dropping, maybe even going negative quite a bit. 
Um, and given how large the coronavirus recession was, um, much larger than, than, than previous recessions, right? um, or at least sharper, right? maybe over an annual period comparable to the financial crisis recession, but, but deeper on a quarterly level. But actually inflation did not, at least it did not decline much or not, not much at all. It, it's, we'll look at it, I mean, if you look back, here was the data series, right? Consumer price inflation. Well, this is, this is the extent of the decline, right? So not much, maybe a percentage point briefly here, but it, 2021, it's already, or already during 2020 in the US, uh, it's back. It never went negative in the UK. It went slightly negative, minus 0.3% in the euro area. So actually we had little uh, reduction in inflation. Why is that? Well, where's that coming from? Well, we'll come back to that in a moment. That's where I want to have my little, my little modeling, macro modeling, macro epidemic modeling uh, advertisement. So what happened? Governments supported incomes um, very extensively. Central banks supported governments by basically buying their debt. Right? Governments issued debt. They uh, financed uh, transfers to households, to companies. And uh, the debt was on a similar or larger scale bought up by the central banks. So it's monetized. Um, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that uh, eventually this led to inflation. There was a high demand for durable goods. So it's not that demand went totally down. Yes, it went down, but there was also a big switch to durable goods because we couldn't go to, uh, and, and as a result, a, a quick recovery of trade, but uh, at the same time, supply bottleneck. In 2021, we had continued shortages of raw materials and intermediate products. We had an increased demand for services and then also labor shortage. And inflation rose quite quickly. And basically in the third stage in 2022, the Russian attack on Ukraine, energy prices rose rapidly and have been rising rapidly. We had an energy crisis in, we had a Russian delivery uh, stop of uh, gas, large, largely a delivery stop. Uh, and that drove inflation to double digits and uh, real rates, however, declined. So the real rates, the real interest rates declined. So monetary policy is actually very supportive because you have negative real interest rates. So it's actually uh, in, in real terms, in purchasing power terms, uh, a very uh, uh, good time to borrow. So monetary policy, as it should, accommodates inflation, but you know, it, it should move from accommodation, nevertheless, to gaining control of inflation again. But uh, so when people ask, well, there are so many sources of inflation, but it has nothing to do with central banks. Uh, you know, I try to create uh, from the start uh, an impression that I don't, I don't buy that. Yes, it's a little bit like, yes, there's a forest um, because, you know, and maybe it's declining because here uh, the oak tree is not growing anymore or, or we have, uh, you know, or, or the, uh, but, but actually the reason the forest is not growing or shrinking is because there is a drought. Right? That's a causal factor. Looking at the individual trees is another issue. So um, it's just like that, there are, there are elements uh, when you think of a currency, it's supplied by the government. It's basically, and inflation is not just the sum of individual price rises, it's basically the purchasing power loss of that currency. Right? Okay, let me give you some data on that. And I wanted to start it on maybe first some theory on, on uh, um, the coronavirus recession. Why? Do, and the question is really, because I want to say we do some research, right? And, and actually, I think in macro modeling, this, this is also a good way maybe to interact with Mises. So why did the deep coronavirus recession not push down inflation more? Um, let me take a look at, let's see if that works, at something we've created. We've created um, a database with macro models, but on top of that, more recently, we've created a database, a public database with macro epidemic models. What are macro epidemic models? It turns out the uh, epidemiolo epidemiologist and our current uh, health uh, minister also studied, uh, has also been a professor of epidemiology. They actually build mathematical models of epidemics. It's something you can build mathematical models and simulate them. It turns out the techniques are not that different from the techniques we use in economics. And so, yes? Yeah, and so in a, the time scale is a bit different because say, the epidemics, they, the, the speed is at a, on a weekly uh, basis uh, infections, but 
basically, um, you know, it's similar dynamic modeling um, that, except that say in macro models, expectations play a big role, but then you might say, hey, expectations like, you know, the, the risk of getting infected should play a big role in academic models, right? Whether you stay away from consumption, whether you stay at home and buy goods online, that should be in there. It's not in there, but when you bring together the economic modeling and the epidemic modeling, you bring exactly that forward thinking that, that risk uh, aversion against infection into the analysis. And a lot of these models have been developed and we've created a database. So now let's see if I can click through it. Yes, that works. So you can actually go on the internet and uh, here we have collected more than 20 of these models. Um, you can download them. You can even simulate them online or look at simulations online. So I'm going to, I'm going to try this. So here it says comparison. Here it says download code. Uh, you may not be able to read that in the back, but so if you want to get into that, you could actually download the code to these models. Here is a little platform. Maybe you can see that. You can actually look at individual models. So I'm going to pick one in particular. So you go over that, you can see that this is, I build this, um, or I shouldn't say I very much. Uh, this was a joint initiative with Matthias Trabant, a new colleague in Frankfurt. He actually was very active in developing uh, these new models together with some fellow um, authors uh, from Northwestern. And so I'm going to select one of these. Um, so it's this one, right? So if I, can, you, can you read it? Eichenbaum, Rebello, Trabant, epidemics in the new Keynesian model. So Stephen, you know, new Keynesian models back and forth. You've been building them too. So here, this is a model which brings the epidemic, the epidemic mo modeling of epidemiologists. I can't believe I can say that. So um, into these macro models, uh, it's a so-called SIR model, right? They're susceptible people. They're susceptible to infections. They are infected people. That's the I, and they are recovered people. There are also people who die of the disease. So it would be an SIRD model. Um, okay, then you know we can we can. In these models, if you want to simulate an epidemic, there has to be a first case, right? So you have some initial infections. So here I'm, I'm clicking on a certain scale of initial infections. And then I can click here on the variables we can look at, right? So you can basically see here uh, four variables. Let me, let me change this here a little bit. Um, oops, actually, let me go back. Um, <laughs> We can group that like this. Okay. So you can see what's happening. Uh, you have people, you know, getting infected. And you have people worrying, a lot of people in this economy worrying about getting infected. So they reduce their consumption. They don't go to the shop. They don't go uh, uh, to the restaurant. Right? So consumption goes down. So this is already before the lockdown. You can look at different policy responses, different policy measures in these models. But this is just the... Uh, caution of people, you know, we don't want to get infected. So consumption goes down also in terms of production, right? There is a, a reduction in labor, right? So in Germany, for example, even industry closed during the lockdown to a large, large extent uh, during that phase. They didn't need to. It was not like that they were forced. Uh, the, the lockdown concerned others, right? It didn't concern industry, but they closed down anyway. And anyway, so you see here as a response, output goes down. And then you can see here, output goes down by minus 8%. So that's a pretty deep uh, trough. What do you see here in terms of inflation? Uh, well, it's 50 basis points. So not much, inflation doesn't go down much. So that's why, where's that coming from? So for, for us uh, Keynesians, that's kind of unusual, right? So let me, let me go back, oops, here, okay. Um, so where is that coming from? It actually turns out that this is very much true, that supply, not just demand, it's not just a recession where you know, we're all scared and demand goes down. It's a recession where actually supply goes down a lot. And so in, in a sense, the diff demand goes down in the simulation a bit more, and that's why inflation goes down. Uh, but the main thing, it's supply driven. If you think about the current recession, well, we're not in recession yet. We have in, in Germany, we had 0.3% growth this quarter. But everyone says we're going to be in recession. I think that's pretty much uh, a done deal. Uh, we'll look at some data in a moment. But in that current crisis, again, you have a supply reduction. So that's 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 an important uh, element to consider. So I'm already 
10 more minutes or? No, no, I have more time, so. Okay, but we're almost done here. So I mentioned some of the, in the first segment, I mentioned some of the uh, policy measures and for example, in the US, you had very large transfers. This is data on US personal income, the aggregate, right? So I said governments supported households and firms and central banks supported governments, right? So looking at the US, this is personal income. So you see actually here, that was Trump. Uh, and, you know, Biden didn't wanna, didn't wanna uh, actually be out Trump by Trump. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually the, the transfers in the US, you know, unemployment rose rapidly in the US. They adjusted via employment. Um, in, the, in the continent, in Germany, in the Euro area, but also in the UK, we mostly adjusted via uh, short-time work, right? So hours went down, but people did get unemployed. But it's interesting to look at the US where really the transfers were so high that in aggregate, you had a big increase in personal income. So it's not surprising that inflation took off with supply going down. Uh, demand, maybe not going up, but demand at least supported by substantial, uh, in the aggregate level, substantial increases in, in transfers. Uh, in the euro area, this was, as I said, we had uh, shorter, short time work, so it didn't go up. Normally under short time work, you have less income, a little bit less, um, so it didn't go up, but at least uh, income remained flat. There was substantial support. Wow. Um, so I mentioned there was this shift towards durable goods. And you can see that this was really also hitting then limited supply. Uh, here is the survey the European Union does on uh, um, shortages of different goods. So or different, I mean, so shortage of demand, of course, in 2020, the green line, right? That was a big issue. Demand was a big concern, but that quickly disappeared. And since then, the big concern has been supply of raw materials and intermediate products, right? I'm not going to go into detail, you know all that. It's also interesting that in the service sector, with the end of the lockdowns and the opening of the economy, we now had the, the, the highest peak here is shortage of labor, right? So this is something I didn't expect, right? Because so the, the corona wasn't just a sudden stop and then we go back to business as usual. It actually meant structural changes and suddenly we have shortages of labor in many areas, even in industry. Uh, the most uh, recent data, it's going down a bit again. So you see some impact of the uh, looming recession, but it's still the biggest concern in services. What about expectations of inflation? We can look at many uh, measures of expectations. So here I'm looking at market-based measures of inflation expectations. You derive them from derivative. This is, this is over the next three years. So this is really a medium-term perspective. Here you can see, and I mean, I guess the Bank of England is deciding tomorrow, right? Uh, Thursday or right tomorrow, sir. Sorry, they've already decided. They're announcing tomorrow. You say, so you know already what they? <laughs> okay, I need, but anyway, so uh, and I guess the Fed is also um, designing today, right? Uh, but so in terms of expectations, so here the UK is certainly, you see, expectations for over the next three years never went down very much in 2000 in the Corona crisis, and they've been steadily rising. And they're the highest here, but also in the US, right? Not perhaps not surprisingly, given the big uh, expenditure or transfers, um, inflation was rising throughout 2021. So it was somewhat of a puzzle to me why the Fed and others talked about, well, this is transitory, it's nothing to worry. Um, I mean, it's not like there was no indication. Even here, market forecasts for the next three years, you see a steady increase. And then the acceleration here, uh, the shock from the energy crisis, but that's only uh, um, the accelerator, the additional fuel in the fire. Um, in the euro area, I said for a long time, so the euro area is blue, right? We they want said, well, it's not as problematic and it's temporary, uh, but then of course um, things picked up, and even now I think the expectation of inflation is highest, higher than in the U.S. over the next three years. Here is uh, the fueling of the fire, the Russian attack. Um, the energy prices, uh, there are three lines. Blue is oil. Why is there only one line for oil? It's basically a world, uh, world market. So I'm showing the Brent price here, but say the US, uh, West, Texas, West intermediate is not that different, right? So basically 
you know, we can ship it around the world. It's, mo it's not little of it by pipeline, most of it by shipping. So um, it's the same price for everyone. That's also why the US was hit, um, but, uh, but it's the same everywhere. Of course, if you can get access, we were talking about some countries, we're not gonna name them, who are somehow importing Russian oil. Of course, that's cheaper now. If you look at the Ural price, so there's some impact of the sanctions. Maybe it could be stronger, but it's certainly, they don't get quite the same price. Um, anyway, so that's been coming down. That's a good news, but you can see here from the futures, it stays elevated. So blue oil price. So we're not out of this, uh, but it's not an unusual rise. The unusual increase is really um, here, um, the natural gas prices. That's the European price, right? Dutch um, price. Um, this is extreme, of course, that's a spot market, but this is more and more getting into consumer price inflation and it's not all there yet, right? So it's, you know, last month, uh, someone like the German, I don't know if they, if they used it in the end, but the Bild Zeitung asked me and they said, well, is that the peak? I said, probably not, because even if it's the peak, even if it's the peak in terms of gas prices, they've been coming down, but until that's passed through to consumers and to, to companies, that takes quite a while. Um, and you can see, um, even though it's down now for next year, it stays up. And the interesting comparison, and that brings me then to industrial society and industry and decisions by industrial leaders or industrial companies. Uh, the interesting thing, element here is not much has happened in North America. The North American gas price is low. So gas is very different from oil. It's, not as, it's much more pipeline dependent. Um, there is liquid gas, you can transport it but increasing the world supply of liquid natural gas is rather hard. Okay, so that's my first segment. We've seen, that, that's what I wanted to say about inflation. And I think I talked so long, uh, I'm not gonna be able to talk as much about the other two points, but let me take a few questions or comments or suggestions. And then I wrap up more quickly on the other two points. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, since in the US, this was rising before. Right? So I would say uh, a significant element in the US also, you could see that rents were rising, uh, wages have been rising quite a bit. So uh, there uh, is a lot of it is also due to basically the excess demand. Right? Um, in the Euro area, it was to a large extent energy driven, but you know, it's just the sequence is different, right? So basically every company is trying to raise prices, pass on that cost. How can they pass it on? Why does it work? Well, who lets them raise prices? Well, because we have a supportive uh, monetary and fiscal policy, right? So we, uh, and so, but nevertheless, we have a cut inflation. So they pass on the, the prices. Of course, if you have 10% inflation, your purchasing power goes down. So that has been eating up the uh, excess uh, savings from the corona crisis. But, well then, and this is happening, of course, now in Germany and other places, then workers demand higher wages, understandably. I mean, unfortunately, I, we're not unionized. Uh, well, I'm a government employee. I shouldn't say, unfortunately, that also has its advantages to be a government employee. But um, yes, I mean, understandably, uh, there are high labor, high wage demands. Uh, the metal sector, uh, just uh, about 8% is what they wanted. Uh, the public sector, which is gonna be relevant for us, wanted more. Uh, publicly administrated wages, such as minimum wages in Germany, were actually raised 20% this year. Um, so yes, there is gonna be a broadening. It's already on the way, it's already happening and visible. Uh, so I think uh, we cannot just say, oh, it's all energy, right? Um, but it did play a bigger role in Europe uh, than in the US. Okay, maybe let me say a few words on the second topic. I'm gonna to skip a little faster. This is something I've been worrying about a lot, um, but maybe let me skip through this. We all, we all know that there are pipelines. But one thing, I said this over lunch. I mean, when we saw these explosions in, in, in the East, uh, in the Baltic uh, Sea, right? The, the, you might say, oh, big deal. We were not using uh, North Stream 1 and 2. Well, just imagine for a moment, the same thing would happen in the North Sea. I mean, we get a lot of uh, gas from Norway. Great Britain gets substantial imports from Norway. 
kind of, for, for Germany, we now get gas basically from Netherlands and from um, Norway. If those pipes are blown up, it would be a total disaster. I have no clue what the capabilities are to protect these. I doubt that they're, it's very easy to protect, but it's a major, so energy security, I mentioned this at, at the beginning of the talk. If you're an industrial uh, leader of a company, deciding where to locate your production, where to source your input from. I mean, these are new questions, both uh, defense, so security per se, in a world of international, more international conflict, but also energy security is a totally new variable in those decisions. Um, in terms of supplies, right, you can see here a chart what's Russia's share uh, in, in European imports, 40%. So this is substantial. And basically it's more than we have in, had in LNG imports. So it's, and the, this is the total imports and the, the diamond is total energy, LNG uh, world trade. So you can see it's very, very, it's basically not possible to just substitute uh, Russian gas with LNG because <laughs> you have to have the whole plants to liquefy it. So it's really just, we are basically trying to buy it away from the Asians, from China, from, from uh, Korea and Japan. And that's why the price is very high. Now, being in the UK, I wanted to look at a little bit of data. So in Germany, we had about 50% of our gas from the UK, from Russia. UK, very different situation. We imported 4% of your natural gas. On top of that, so I'm going to have some good news, you know, comparatively good news uh, comparing the UK and, and Germany here. Your import dependence is 57%. Our import dependence is somewhere around 95% in terms of natural gas, right? Um, in terms of oil, uh, we imported 30% of the oil from Russia. You imported 9%, but you only need 26%. Right? So um, very different, the question of energy security. How natural gas is used? Well, I'll come back to that, but a big chunk here is used for heating. And then here is some electricity production. And this is industry, 37%. It's very seasonal, so we build up storage. And I guess from our talk earlier, maybe the storage has a different role uh, in Europe, but it's basically seasonal, right? Most of the gas is used in winter for heating. So we store it. We pump it. A lot of storage is just, you pump it underground. Um, so even storage, gas storage, is just pumped underground, right? So it's not unusual to pump something underground. I come back to that uh, in a moment. Storage is not sufficient to get through the winter. Um, it ba because it's basically, I'm, I'm not showing this. Well, let me show this. Everyone in Germany, just the news again yesterday. We reached 99% filling. We've never done that. Fantastic. Everyone can calm down. It was safe. Well, you know, we're not safe. Uh, uh, it's 28% of annual consumption, right? So it depends how much is flowing in through the winter, right? And how much we actually burn through the winter. So now, you know, October has been ex extremely warm. So we've been lucky, uh, but uh, that is not sufficient. Uh, not surprising, um, we have a recession looming, but let me show, I, I promised some good news. So semi good news. So where do we stand in terms of economic activity uh, ahead of this looming recession or as we are now entering recession um, in the fourth quarter? Gray is here is Germany. And uh, you see uh, Germany is just, this was the, this is GDP, and I put all these countries you can see here, they are the same in 2019. So I make it so GDP is 100 in 2019. So what you see here is the cumulative growth from 2019. So Germany has just about reached uh, the pre crisis, uh, pre crisis level of GDP. Here, the US um, has grown well above. So it's not like we're doing that great, but okay, we were very proud and very happy uh, in Corona saying, well, we were somehow did better. We were also luckier, of course. Uh, if you look at the UK, uh, UK was severely hit. Maybe Brexit also played a role, uh, uh, we suspect, but it was also hit much more severely by the Corona pandemic. Uh, but you can see, interestingly, uh, GDP has recovered, is now also at the pre-crisis level. In Italy, that has also happened, right? Recently, the economists, they compared Britain and Italy. So here, Italy is actually in terms of cumulative growth ahead of Germany a little bit. So Germany has not done that well uh, in 2021 and 2022. We've gone, so you know, no reason to be delighted. Uh, if we uh, look at the recession, let me just forecasts here are between for next year between minus 0.3 and minus three. 
the IMF says minus 0.3, but that is still a minus a three percentage point revision. So uh, basically uh, the forecast from March to now has come down by three percentage, three percent of GDP. Right. So that's a substantial, and that's basically to a significant extent related to the delivery stop of gas and the, the long conflict and the realization we're going to have to deal with a much higher energy price, but much higher natural gas price for a longer time. How does that affect industrial society? How does affect, that affect industrial production? Companies are basically have to think about if they are energy intensive, where they're going to locate that energy intensive production or where are they going to put investment. Um, and so that's a second interesting comparison. If you look again for Germany, Germany here in gray, as I mentioned, we closed a lot of production in the Corona pandemic. Actually, you see um, not as bad as in Italy, but substantially worse than in the US. And actually we didn't recover. So even today, we're still 10 percentage points below, 10% uh, below the level of 2018. And what I was surprised, right, and we talked earlier, and maybe not all is dark in the UK. Uh, I mean, of, of course, the UK has a smaller industrial sector, but first of all, it did not, it, it was doing better between 2018 and 2020. It went down, but it has actually recovered quite well. It's above the 2018 level. So um, I was surprised I actually prepared that for today. And first I was asking, can that be right? Are we making a mistake? But so far I haven't found the mistake. So, uh, and maybe now more companies are thinking, yeah, and if it's pharmaceuticals and if it's chemical, then looking forward, energy is gonna matter even more, right? Who is gonna locate out of Germany now or doing new investment elsewhere, especially energy intensive investment in the chemical sector, but also in the metal sector. You can see the shares, of course, we have 24% of GDP in industrial, UK is closer to 17%, but at least it's rising. So um, I, I'm quite worried about Germany going forward and about German industry. I think this downward trend is continuing. And uh, I think the government is not doing what's needed. So let me maybe sh shift, finish with a, with a few, uh, Last remarks on economic policy. I think central banks need to act to restore price stability. They need to raise interest rates. Maybe that's gonna be a question uh, later on, so I'll come back to that. Um, I think, so for example, these are futures from markets. So markets expect interest rates to rise to 3% in Germany, in the Euro area, sorry, and uh, about 5% in the US and the UK. Um, whether the 3% in the euro area are enough, I'm very skeptical. I think probably you need more and whether they will do it, um, is, be able to do it um, is, is questionable. So we'll probably have negative real rates for longer and possibly inflation higher than currently expected. Uh, let me skip through the model excursion here um, because I can't keep you hostage so long. Uh, maybe if there's a question later on. Now, what about, what about so I think, Central banks have the task of price stability and they can do it. I mean, currently there are a lot of news going through Germany, it even was in the target show. Central banks cannot do anything about it. Well, the shock happened and they're accommodating it. But of course, the most powerful instrument to bring inflation expectations down is the interest rate policy by the central bank. I mean, anything other would be a mistake to think. Certainly, certainly uh, more government borrowing is not gonna lower uh, inflation. Uh, if anything, that's going to drive inflation higher. Um, so governments want to incentivize a reduction of gas consumption. That's good, right? So I said government's reaction. So we move from central banks to governments. is partially correct, right? They should incentivize uh, the, the more efficient usage and reduction of gas consumption. And that's important. But there's also partially contradictory um, and very costly measures. So if you look at France or Spain, they've actually from the start been limiting gas prices, they've been limiting electricity prices. And so for example, in Spain, in the summer, because of the unusual hot summer, gas usage went up. As a how should we get through the winter if Spain doesn't use solar energy to, in the summer to cool? And now in Germany, we want to use solar energy in the winter to heat. Well, it's, not, it's probably not gonna be sufficient, right? Um, anyway, so you see there's a sense of uh, uh, sarcasm here. Uh, we also want to pay large scale transfers. That's something we've currently just decided in Germany to support households and firms. The way these transfers, uh, these, um, transfers are being decided, the so-called gas price break, 
is at least in a way, so it's a, a, a lump sum transfer. It's not limited, it's not linked to the actual current price of gas. So uh, it should, if people understand it correctly, it should maintain the incentive to save. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but it's a lot of money they uh, put it, take into their hands and put it in the window and or advertising it. And they probably uh, much of it be, will be spent. In total, they've talked about 5.6% of GDP. Um, that might, even if it doesn't prevent uh, gas save, ga reduction in or saving of gas, it does provide for more expenditure by households and will therefore push core inflation to the extent it's actually expended for other goods. Say you, you pay less, you get the transfer. So instead of spending it on, on, on your heating, you spend it on food or on the restaurant or other services. There's a high fiscal costs and government bond rates have risen with inflation. So the second point to governments, I think that resonates here, uh, safeguard sustainability of government finances. In uh, Germany, there was a lot of schadenfreude, right? We, particularly in the more left circles, you in the UK, you're totally wrong. You know, you always thought trickle down economics, tax cuts that works. I think that's not the issue. I think you, it would have been the same problem if you announce a big spending program, which is financed by debt. There are limits. And in Germany, there are many who haven't understood that there are limits, right? So it's really about uh, keeping uh, a sustainability of government finances and also financial stability. So let me jump through that. If there are questions, I. For those interested, we did some research on what can governments actually carry in the euro area and had some, I think, interesting results, but I don't, I don't mention them here. My last point, this goes particularly to the German government, but I was interested coming here, you know, I just Googled the word energy security strategy, energy security strategy. Now, uh, you know, in, in, in Germany, we like to think of Boris Johnson as a clown and he's of course always been made fun of, uh, but actually I hit something. Uh, some pronouncement, some plan uh, in April, published by the UK government. Uh, and uh, um, it was actually a medium to long-term strategy for uh, improving energy security and expand energy supply. There was the idea of expanding energy supply in there. He talked about nuclear, he talked about uh, offshore wind, he talked about uh, um, a lot of things. I tried that for Germany, I searched longer. The only thing I could think about in terms of strategy is a strategy how to get through the next winter. That's not a strategy. That's a response to the current crisis. The strategy is looking forward to a goal and how to reach it. That's totally missing. Um, and so I think we're basically talking about using more coal until April next year. But why would we, we be able to stop that coal uh, burning the, uh, in May? I don't know, right? So that will have to extend it. So we'll have more CO2 emissions. It's not climate friendly. We should build up uh, renewables. It really expands, it requires expanding the infrastructure. That hits uh, a lot of problems. You know, nobody wants it. It's not in my own backyard, right? NIMBY, not in my backyard. Um, that's very prevalent. We haven't found a good way around it. So there are good strategies on expanding renewables. Um, I've read some interesting articles on offshore wind in the UK, right? You, uh, we have more onshore wind, but you can't expand it that much more and that much more quickly. But there are big trade-offs in terms of nature and land use. You have to overcome them. Now, as long as you can't easily store renewables, right? if you haven't developed this infrastructure for hydrogen or other ways of storing it, if you don't have a lot of mountains like Switzerland or Austria, uh, we really need to make uh, get those solutions and we need to work with something else, nuclear power or natural gas. So Germany was planning on Russian gas for a long time. We have not made any new plans because we also want to get out of nuclear power. Now we decided nuclear power will remain in place until April. Uh, well, what happens after April? By magic, we suddenly have an, all the renewables we need. We'll see, I doubt it. So personally, I think we should actually have prolonged all available nuclear power plants still for 10 years. That's climate friendly. If we don't want nuclear, if we don't want to expand nuclear power, I mean, Poland announced plans to build up to six nuclear power stations. If we don't want to expand nuclear power, we need to go to natural gas. We can import that in a liquid state, very expensive. Industry will likely, to the extent it's energy intensive, move outside of Germany. We could actually uh, extract gas in Germany 
it's basically a little known secret. I'll show you a picture. Uh, it's a little uh, a well kept secret um, that we actually have substantial natural gas in Germany. Uh, it's unfortunately shale gas or shale oil. Uh, but we had a commission looking at that in 2016 or a federal institute. Uh, it's basically even on average about 800 billion cubic meter. That's about 16 times, 16 times the Russian import. So that's, that's pretty big. Uh, you can see here it's spread different locations in Germany. Um, we also had an expert commission looking at fracking and what the side effects are. Um, and I say it's manageable with minimal risk. That's a well-kept secret. You're not allowed to talk about it. Uh, you're immediately blacklisted by, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get a lot of, I'm not blacklisted, but you tweet about it. You get a lot of pushback, right? From very, uh, but then I'm saying, okay, you don't want nuclear power. You don't want uh, the wind uh, power in your backyard. You don't, well, what are we gonna do? The only adjustment left is to reduce energy intensive production. I think that's uh, a problem. So that's where we stand. You've seen my proposals. Thank you for your attention. Well, um, monetary and the monetary side, I think there's no way around uh, basically raising interest rates. Substantially, the reason is the following. The crisis we have is really, at least so far, a problem on the supply side. We have, you can either see it as a negative technology shock, even Corona, you could partially see as a negative productivity or technology shock. So supply, you know, the supply side is going down. So on balance, the demand side stays above it. So that's why we had, that's consistent with the inflation push we observed, right? Even without, before the war. So if the energy crisis is that same thing now, um, you know, it's not a question. Yes, the, the, the central bank, of, of course, they could buy oil futures and intervene in the oil market, but yes, they cannot generate more supply of energy. Um, but yes, they can restrain demand. That's their main job. So I think there's no way around that. Uh, I'm also somewhat skeptical whether the recession we see really pushes down inflation by itself. That's why I went a little bit in this uh, detail for the corona crisis, where we saw also inflation didn't decline much, even though you had a very deep recession. Right? And the energy crisis is also to a significant extent on the supply side, not exclusively right now, People have seen the high inflation. They see my purchasing power is down. So they're looking for cheaper goods. They're spending less. The demand is also going to be down, uh, but it's not mainly demand driven, right? So we have to, we have to do that. That's unfortunate. Um, and it doesn't help to let inflation get out of control. Uh, in terms of the fiscal side, well, the mantra and basically Christine Lagarde. So now I, I, I just read the, the, the press conference. And so suddenly I find I'm saying a lot of the same things. So a year ago, that was different. Um, but yes, yeah, so she said, well, fiscal policy should be targeted at, at helping the most vulnerable right? companies and people. Uh, but now we're getting much more, of course, and pretty much everywhere. Uh, why is that? Well, politicians want to win elections and uh, you actually have to think of the population and everyone is, is hit. In Fr France did it right away, right? They, they just, you know, the biggest scare for Macron is the yellow vest. So he wants to keep them off the streets. So basically, they cut, they capped uh, gas and uh, and electricity prices. That's not a clever policy if you want to save energy, but it does uh, provide some political stability. And uh, what it means effectively is that well, it has to be backed up by taxes. Uh, so basically, it's mostly a redistributional policy. Uh, one of the members of parliament of, in the Green Party I, when I was in Berlin, giving a talk in Berlin recently or or on a panel. 
um, and, and just the same day, one of the members of the Green Party had said in Parliament, well, we want to achieve a fair distribution of the laws. Well, okay, um, maybe that helps doing that. We'll see, it depends who ends up paying, but we have a very broad based support. Um, and it means it, it's just mostly a redistributional impact. You could say it also helps maybe keeping some production in place. Maybe some companies who cannot currently raise prices, but have a good future, you know, after the next two winters. But it's not as, that's that may well be. Um, but it's not the same as Corona. Corona was kind of okay. We have a stop. We have to give companies loans. So in afterwards we restart and they can pay them back. Here it's a really uh, a big change in the competitive situation and uh, energy intensive production. If we don't get the uh, energy supply up, will not be able to be competitive. So for example, fertilizer will not be competitive to produce that in Germany compared to North America, right? Um, I mean, it'll take a long time to, to get electricity from other sources and, or, or, and produce hydrogen or ammonia. So um, in that sense, uh, fiscal policy cannot prevent that. Only that's why I focus so much of, on, on the supply. And in Germany, we have a very generous policy now this is what the government learned with Corona. You have to kind of put really big measures in the window and then everyone is calms down. Well, yeah, but this is not really going to help us in, in, a, in, a, in a, very much in terms of keeping uh, growth and, and uh, industry in Germany. So um, I think we need to, we basically have built up this support or we're building up currently the support pillar, but in terms of we're very, very stingy in terms of energy supply. It's like, because we seem to like the story that the renewable revolution is around the corner and basically almost tomorrow we will be able to do everything with renewables. That's totally unrealistic. Um, yeah, so that's my quick response on the monetary and fiscal. Hmm. I think ultimately it depends on central banks. So uh, independent of the structural developments, um, if they are committed enough, they can, I'm just looking back to the forecasts, they can, they can uh, control inflation. Um, so you can see that here, right? If, if the, here, the, the, ex the expectation here is over the next three years is 3%. Right? But that means since we're coming from above 3%, this means that the market really is, is in a sense, very optimistic because it, 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 I, we talked about 73 at the start, right? When the Anglo-German foundation started. In the past, we never had an, uh, an energy price shock uh, with inflation coming back as quickly as we currently expect. So um, I think um, people are getting doubts about that, but I'm still, hoping for the best, but certainly the market expectations are like this. If you ask the experts, I still expect inflation to come down. Interestingly, if you ask households, like the, the Bundesbank, they have done a survey of households since a while. Households uh, have been getting more pessimistic, right? And, and expecting longer term inflation, uh, three, uh, 3 or more. The share of households expecting that it's going up. Now, whether markets and experts will drive, in, if their expectations will drive inflation, then it's gonna come down. If central banks will do what's necessary, it'll come down, but it's not, it's not for sure, right? But I'm still, I think it can be done, definitely, even if the structural forces are such that energy becomes more expensive because of greening the economy. But there you could say the current high brass price of gas actually gives a big incentive. We never had such a big incentive to build up renewables, right? The only problem right now is if one looks, one realizes there are a lot of impediments, right? We actually need to have the companies to build it. We need to have the supplies. We need to have the regulation. You know, it cannot take, if you look in Germany, whether if you look at a state like governed by the Greens or, or by, um, by some other party, they don't, they're not very different in terms of the speed of the buildup of wind power. We have the same regulation. It takes a long time, right? So. That's the impediment right now. We'll have to see how, the, how, that, uh, how that is really broken up and, and accelerated. But I'm, uh, so these are all, but, but, but at least the high price creates strong incentives. 
to to have an expansion there. Yeah. Okay, now this is going to be your fault. Uh, you, if, if I still have a minute or two, uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually, so I did, had a little, little model exercise which goes directly at these two questions. And so the model we use, uh, or you guys use, we all use in, in economic, macroeconomics is a Phillips curve. You can have a huge model built around it. It's somewhere in, in this database, which I didn't show, the macro financial modeling database. All these models have a Phillips curve in, some, in one or the other way. Here's a very simple one. And uh, here, inflation depends on uh, the output gap, right? That's basically demand and supply or demand versus potential. This is where the central bank comes in. Uh, it can you know, drive up real interest rates, reduce savings. Uh, there are cost push shocks. So that's the, the price, um, you know, oil price is part of that. But then there's this expected future and past inflation. And here I use the word, um, I use the word, um, central bank target driven expectations so this here this expected future deflation takes into uh, inflation this measure takes into account that central banks promise two percent or, or a bit more um, and they really believe and that that's when everyone believes that you know so basically when you have a weight of phi equal to zero so one minus phi that should be a one so if that's basically unity then the promise of the central bank if it's fully believed has a lot of power and behind these market expectations is a very high weight on central bank target-driven inflation expectations. The experts think, well, five years from now, what do I do? What do I know about what inflation will be? Nothing. The economy, the data tells me nothing. The only thing, if I believe the central bank can fix it, and if they basically say we're going to fix it, we do whatever is necessary to get it two percent, I can use that as my five-year or ten-year forecast. Because remember, it's just basically the purchasing power of a government supplied asset, paper money or, or digital. Nowadays, it's just digital money. They control the supply. So ultimately, they control the purchasing power, right? The, the, what you can buy, how much you can buy. Not in the short run, right? We know this money and inflation in the short run, you know, money demand varies a lot. So it's not a, a close link, but they can control it. But if if like these households, if we just look at where is inflation now, I call it here a little bit uh, facetious. Anyway, I'm being a little because data driven is, is a word that ECB has been using. Their policy is data driven. Well, if the households, if their forecasts are data driven, if they say, well, inflation is 10% today, it probably will not be 2% tomorrow. Maybe it'll be 8%, right? Maybe in two years, it'll be 6%, right? So that's the past inflation. That's the data driven inflation. And uh, basically, if we run models, and, and this relates to, if we run models where it's primarily this factor driving things, right? Then you get this kind of simulation. Sorry? The, show what? Okay, I put two policy rules in here, right? So uh, this model, I, I will also, it also has a demand side, and I will put two, two different policy rules, uh, two versions of the so-called Taylor rule, right? So this is for the, this is now for the for the um, people who want to push me into the details. Okay, good. So here, this is the standard Taylor rule, right? You respond, if inflation is above target, they raise interest rates. If output is above potential, they raise interest rates. And I'm comparing it to some accommodative rule, a policy which says, we just want to keep output close to potential. So it has a much bigger uh, factor here, eight times bigger, right? So it's like the difference between uh, the Bank of England saying, uh, we care about both. We care about being in a recession and we care about inflation being above target versus mostly caring about, you know, let inflation go where it goes. We fix it in the long run. And it turns out now, if you run now here, I'm using the central bank target driven model, right? So it really has all the weight here on expected future inflation. If you use that, and if you have a, cost push shock, so a, a rise in cost, energy costs and other things. 
you see inflation is going up uh, and then it drops down. So you can see this is the kind of model uh, the Fed or, or the ECB was working with, right? When they were saying it's transitory, don't worry. And you can basically see whether you use red, red is here the accommodative rule, uh, blue is the Taylor rule. You see the accommodation gets you a little bit more inflation, but no big deal, you know, it's a little bit higher. And then it drops down after four quarters. So you can, and, but the, the benefit is the accommodating policy keeps output close to, close to potential. So you can see how these guys were running the show when they were talking until basically December, 2021, don't worry, it'll come back by itself. But if you feed in this model, a much more data-driven expectations formation. If you look at these households who just say, well, inflation will stay high. If they dominate the model of inflation, then you get something like this, right? Inflation really getting off track, right? So we're, we've been moving in that direction and now they have to quickly act to regain, to regain credibility. Right. Yeah. Yeah, let's collect some questions. Yeah. 
Maybe I'll, I'll okay. Okay, one round. Yeah. 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 Okay, well. <laughs> Sorry, the unemployment gap in in which uh, in which country? The Fed. The Fed. Yeah. Okay, maybe so. Uh, basically, three, three, three questions. Yeah, three questions on multi policy and and inflation expectations, and then energy markets. So let me first do the multi policy uh, inflation. Um, starting, uh, I guess, from your question. Uh, yes, we would think that at some point, real rates have to rise in response to an inflation, and uh, we are far from that, right? So if you take the euro, if you take the UK. Uh, here, this expectation that race, rates will rise by to 5% next year. That's what the market expects. At the same time, the market expects uh, that, uh, what is it, that in, in inflation, well, inflation expectations of 5% over the next five, between five and six over the next three years. So uh, we're a long way from significantly positive real rates. And you could do that for every country. It's the same, you know, they expect 3%. Uh, of inflation, interest rates in Europe. So the market see, and many uh, experts, including some banks, seem to think that we don't need much in terms of getting uh, inflation down. And that, so the, the risk, in my view, is bigger that we're too optimistic here than the other side where, oh, what happens if energy prices fall, if we have a deep recession, maybe we are suddenly have inflation, ex inflation in negative territory. I think the first risk is much higher. And I think central banks should be risk managers uh, they are, and not just point forecasters. Um, so maybe that's, that's on that. That gets me, so yes, I mean, if you compare to the 70s, in the 70s, say the Bundesbank in Germany, they basically had very long period of very high real interest rates. And even in the US, they, they, most of the time, the normal rate was a bit above inflation. Um, so, we for now we have a very beneficial outlook, very benign outlook. The word, right? Oh, the money supply you mentioned. Yes. So basically, if you look at Corona, I didn't use that data here, but in the euro area, it was very clear. We actually, for the first time, had since the financial crisis, before the financial crisis, we had double-digit broad money growth. The years before, we had basically, in spite of all the central bank asset purchases, we had about four to five percent, which was basically consistent with two to three percent inflation but then we had this spike a lot of government borrowing and a lot of monetization and money growth going to double digits and, and that was one of the reasons why i've basically been talking or giving interviews to the press so i can always point to it which nobody likes you know if you but basically since february 2022 i was saying i think the risks are bigger that we overshoot inflation and at the time i got a lot of pushback who are you I mean, Germany is mostly German press. Uh, the ECB says this is temporary, right? So of course, you know, the Ukraine war is another story, but you could see the increase. So I think uh, this time around, broad money growth uh, gave a very clear signal, which, and we had a spike in inflation even before the war, right? So, uh, so that gives some credence to that. Uh, we, we shouldn't totally throw it out as people have done. So I think for me, at least, it was one of the reasons I turned more skeptical. Uh, in terms of the balance, I would say for the same reasons I just outlined, multi-policy is uh, currently not even expected to generate positive real interest rates. So it's not, so it's generally supportive of equity demand. I mean, I, I don't, I if we raise the real interest rate from minus three to minus one, I don't consider that as really breaking the economy so it drops in a deep recession. I mean, so I think on balance right now, I would, as a risk manager, I would say mostly go and fight inflation. And then in terms of the other side, I think fiscal policy and energy supply is, is better. Fiscal policy cannot create the energy, but it you know, can do some redistribution of the costs. Um, and then to the last question, oh, I mentioned uh, the unemployment gap. Yes, the Fed looks more at the unemployment gap, uh, but one thing which is clear is we have record employment. We have uh, very low, both in the Euro area and in the US. Uh, so a clear signal that, that they need to tighten much more. In terms of energy, if I may for half a minute, 
Uh, I think it's very important what you say. I think it's even worse. It's worse. Um, of course, we need a lot of investment. Um, everyone wants the investment in, uh, everyone says they want the investment in renewables and at least the high uh, prices for fossil energy for some type of renewable investment, for example, in Germany now, of course, everyone wants to, for security reasons, because you're worried about blackouts and things like that. Now everyone thinks, can I put some solar on my roof if you have a house, right? Or, uh, or can I, what can I do? Can I get the, um, the heating where you use the ground heating? But it's very expensive. So once you look, I've looked at it for our house, and a lot of people look at it, very, the, the, the solar on the roof, I think supplies are coming in terms of panels from next year, it's probably gonna be easier again. You need to find the company to put it up, it's feasible. But in terms of the heating, it's gonna be, uh, it's extremely costly. So uh, even there, and so that's just the local, right? Because if you talk to a lot of the, the supporters of the Greens, they think, oh, we have to do everything local. Right? Everyone does its own energy. We all become little farmers of our energy, right? That's not really efficient, but so that some of that will happen. Um, but you know, now we think about the, the electricity price break. What's the idea there? There are a lot of profits now going to those who put up renewable energy because it's you know they get the gas price. The, the price for what's very expensive is to use natural gas for electricity production now. So those companies who are using renewables make a big profit. What do we do? We want to tax them. We want to tax it away. Well, that's not going to raise the incentive to invest in renewables. Hello. Uh, so maybe this is the one time you don't want to talk about taxing excess profits, even if you're on the left and green, right? I would think. But anyway, it's coming. So that even makes it worse. Uh, and in terms of other areas, we're really punishing it, right? If you think of the ESG uh, uh, financial, we make it hard. So now if, if you would do, okay, let, if, you, if, if they would allow shale gas extraction in Germany, and if you would want to get uh, funding for that, the banks would all turn away, right? It's very hard. It's very costly because, well, we got all this regulation. Yes, see. And uh, it gets even worse. Um, so defense, right? We need defense. But we have, where's the funding coming from? And our, um, we have, uh, so uh, sorry, I have to mention the foreign ministry, I think. So that's going to be, you don't have to comment. But so we have, we have the Ministry of the Economy and Climate Affairs who travels around the world, Mr. Habeck, President Minister Habeck, travels around the world uh, begging even people like the Sheikh of Qatar to please sell us a lot of liquefied gas. He says, well, we can't, uh, the earliest we can send is in 2026. Okay, so he travels to, to Norway, to Canada, of course, with limited success. Apparently, I just read in the Frankfurt Allgemeine, so it must be true, an interview with the lead, uh, the, the person from Greenpeace, which our foreign minister hired, uh, J J Morgan? Yeah. Jennifer Morgan. Jennifer Morgan. So Jennifer Morgan revealed in the interview that when she travels around, so she went to Senegal, for example, she advised, and previously uh, we've asked them to export more, she advises them not to invest in fossil energy extraction because it's from the past. In the future, we'll have renewable. So contradictory. <laughs> But you see, the, the, I think you raised the point about profits. I think profits certainly for renewables would be there. Also, uh, I think for, because we need energy security, people are willing to pay extra for security. So if you choose gas or nuclear to have a bridge, right, for the next 15 to 20 years, you will get some money, but it's, you have to offer big rewards. So we should do much more uh, to basically create a, a favorable environment, not with subsidies, but basically with the regulation which allows it, which welcomes it. And has a real, all I want is pragmatism, a realistic approach. We have the same idea about the long uh, run target, right? We wanna go to a emissions free uh, world, maybe by 2050, if all goes well, um, but we have to get there, right? And if we get there in a way which is extremely expensive or which basically means that industry is gonna move out uh, of our countries uh, to, we're not going to solve the problem because it's a global problem. So, 